uh, thinking about the message this week, I think about uh, when I first became a believer, that would be how many years now? Um, 49 years ago, 1972, when I got saved in Philadelphia. I remember in those first few months, 1972, I got saved in January. By September, well, in the middle of that, I was thinking what I wanted to do with my life. And I was signed up, I was registered to go to Temple Pharmacy School, and I was supposed to start there at the end of August, 72. But I had itching, and I, I, wanted, I didn't want to do pharmacy, and uh, with the thought of maybe becoming a medical doctor after transferring over. So I decided instead that I wanted to study the Bible. So in those few months, um, I decided that I heard there was Bible schools that you could study the Bible, there were seminaries, but I wanted to start off with Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. And so I felt God calling me to go to Moody Bible Institute. It was a strange time. I felt safe and secure. I loved Philadelphia, loved my home, my family was all there. I felt very comfortable. But I felt God nudging and God pushing and God speaking to me and telling me, go to Chicago. Now you have to understand, I've said this many times, for us on the East Coast, Chicago is the end of the world. We don't know about the West Coast. We, don't, we only go to Chicago and back. But Chicago was far enough for me. But I, I remember thinking that I was feeling uncomfortable. There was uncertainty. Because I was going to leave. First, I was going to leave in my Vega. That's bad enough. I had my Vega, and I was going to go to Chicago. I didn't know anyone there. I didn't have any money. Uh, and I was all alone. My whole worldly possessions were in the back seat of my Vega. And so there was uncertainty. I knew there would be difficulties. I didn't know what to expect. But I did know one thing. God had called me. I did know that God was going with me. So as I faced uncertainty and difficulties, I didn't know what to expect. Now, I went to Chicago and had a great time in Chicago. Maybe I'll tell you about it later. But um, after Chicago, at the end of those couple years, I got married. And when we were, Fran and I were about to get married, we planned it all. And Fran was coming from Cincinnati. And I was coming from Chicago. We got married. And what did we know? I was 26. Fran was 21, a young lady. And we didn't, you know, we only knew each other a little bit. You don't know each other until you're married 47 years like we are. But we didn't know. And, and we were going and we were called to go to Brooklyn. And I knew, I didn't know too much about Brooklyn. But I did know one thing. God was calling me, and God was going with me. But there was uncertainty, and I knew there would be difficulties. And I had many different trans uh, transitions in my life after that. And I remember always wondering. What, I didn't know what to expect. But I did know, like I said, two things. One, God called me. And two, I knew he was going with me. And so, similar throughout my whole life and our whole life, through difficult times, which we all go through, through strange times like this, this last year, with COVID, and with all kinds of things going on with the elections and our government. Everything was, uh, is uncertain and difficult. So I didn't know, I don't know what to expect, but I did know one thing. God is still with us. And so I was sharing, I'd like to share a few things about that, that um, through difficulties, and if you have your outlines, you might take them out or follow along, uh, through our difficulties and unforeseen circumstances, we should trust God for a better future. I also have a few other things with better future. I would also have, we should trust God for a glorious future. We should trust God for success. We can trust God, even in the midst of uncertainty. And that uh, does, should calm our hearts when we go through these difficult times. And so I wanted to pick up a couple stories in the Bible to show going from what was safe and comfortable to what is uncertain and what God does with us. And so I, I have a couple stories, uh, biblical stories, that teach us some principles. So follow along. If you have your scriptures, follow along. The first thing I, I write down here that I thought about was God takes us from the known to the unknown. 
Now, hopefully, some of you think, wait, wait a second. God takes us from the unknown to the known. No, 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 no. He doesn't. He takes you first from the known to the unknown. You don't know what God's going to do. He doesn't reveal the future to us. He purposely, because we, in fact, you don't want to know the future. God holds it back from us. He takes us from the known to the unknown. And the story I have there with that is the story of Abraham. God took Abraham from the known to the unknown. He gives him promises, but uh, he won't tell us necessarily the future. So we start with Abraham and his story. Abraham was, I broke down, secure and prosperous. Those of you who don't know Abraham's life, be, uh, when, he was, uh, when he was a pagan, when he was in Ur of the Chaldeans, Abraham was safe, he was secure, and he was prosperous. Follow along, uh, Stephen in the book of Acts chapter 7 says it this way, and he, meaning Abraham, uh, he, and he said, uh, God said to Abraham, Hear me, brethren and fathers. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. Stephen is talking to the Jewish people, and he says, God appeared to Abraham, to our father Abraham, when he was in Mesopotamia. A lot of people don't know what Abraham's life was like in Mesopotamia. We just know of his land in the land of Israel from Genesis 12 on. But when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived and came to Haran and then to Israel, Abraham lived in a place called Ur, Ur of the Chaldeans. It was a special a culture uh, we don't often study about it called the Sumerian, not Sumerian, Sumerian culture, which was advanced. It was sophisticated. Abraham had a home in Ur of the Chaldeans. Abraham was an older man already. He was, he was 50, 60. He was with, Abraham was with his father. Abraham was with his three brothers. Abraham was with their wives and his wife. Abraham was with his nephew, Lot. Abraham's wife, Sarah, didn't have any children, but they had children. This was a nice family affair. Not only that, but it seems like Abraham was well off there. Um, it tells us the, the city was wealthy, populous, sophisticated. It was a pagan center. It wasn't, uh, they didn't know of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham lived in that pagan center. It is about 220 miles southeast of Baghdad today. That's where Abraham lived. Most, the most prosperous and literate the culture ever was was during Abraham's time. It's a well-known culture at that time. Um, a great pagan, what they call ziggurat, that steps going up leading to like sort of a pyramid where they worshipped pagan gods and idols, was there in the city. Abraham probably knew of it. We don't know about his worship. But that's when God called Abraham. He was safe and secure in his own home with his family. It says, you, uh, Nehemiah says it this way, you are the Lord God who chose Abram, before he changed his name, and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans. Abraham's life was known and safe and secure there. Genesis 15, he says, and he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur. God reminds Abraham, I called you out of there. God called Abraham when he was safe and secure. And you know, God calls us many times when we're safe and secure. And he calls us to what? We're not always clear and sure. But God does take us away from the known and to, and to the unknown. And you don't know what he's going to do. I know in my life at one point, God took me and had my salary reduced a lot. I lost my home, my congregation, my friends. And God says, go. I said, you took everything away from me. Where were you sending me? And then the Lord looked at me and said, I'm not going to tell you. And I said, thank you very much. But God does that. He took my good friend, Michael Rodano, got a congregation in Long Island, and he called him. His salary was tremendously reduced. And he said, I want you to go to Chicago to Moody. And I could picture Michael saying, well, what's going to be there? I said, I'm not going to tell you. You'll go. Because God sends us, and he calls us from the known to the unknown, from, the, from being prosperous, maybe secure, to the unknown. It says in Genesis 12, 1, Now the Lord said to Abraham, and I, what I'm saying now is first from safety and security actually to uncertainty and difficulties. And so God calls Abraham out of safety, brings him to the land of Israel, and it says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go forth from your country, from your relatives, from your father's house, to the land I'm going to show you. I don't know what the conversation was like. Uh, Abraham said, you got a nice place for me there. You're, you're, God says, I'm not telling you. Go. I'm not sure he even knew where he was going. He says, I'll lead you. Hebrews 11. 
by, Ab- by faith, Abraham, when he was called, he obeyed, going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. At least I knew God was calling me to Chicago. It's funny, I was just telling my wife this week, in, uh, in the uh, summer, spring of 1972, people said to me, where are you going? I said, Chicago. They said, no, no, where in Chicago? And I went, Chicago. They said, no, 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 do you have a house? Do you have a place to stay? I said, no. Where are you going? I said, Chicago. I got in my car, literally. I had no place to stay in Chicago. Got in my car and was driving. To where? Chicago. That's all I knew. Didn't know where in Chicago. I knew I was supposed to go to school at Moody Bible Institute, but I didn't know if I had a place there. I didn't know where I was going. God called us. He does. So Abraham went not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in a land of promise, uh, in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac, who dwelt in tents, Jacob, who dwelt, fellow heirs of the same. He, He didn't know anything. Uncertainty. Now, at least God's calling me. Things will be good for me. Genesis 12.10. 12.10. Now there was a famine in the land. Picture Abraham. I get there. I had nice meat. I had brisket. I had ch- uh, chopped liver. I had a lot of good food in the era of the Chaldee. Here, there's a famine. Why have you brought me to this land? You know, it's funny because sometimes in the ministry, we talk to people who want to go into the full-time ministry. And one of the main questions we say to them, are you called? Yes. Can you tell us about your calling? The reason we ask that is because you can face anything when you know God has called you. All the difficulties don't matter. God has called you. And God called Abraham. And it says, now there was a famine in the land. When, and so Abraham tried to find food. He went down to Egypt to sojourn there. Genesis 13. Now there was strife. So he's got famine. He's got strife between his nephew Lot's people and his people, and they're fighting. Lord, I thought you called me. I was good and safe. Now I have uncertainty and difficulties in this land that you've called me to. So there was strife between uh, his people and Lot's people. Then in Genesis, we're not going to go there, in Genesis 15, he was afraid that maybe the nations that he just battled in chapter 14 of Genesis might be coming after him. There was fear. Genesis 16. Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. So Sarah said to Abraham, now... Behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Now, on top of it, Sarah's barren. Then he's got the problem with Hagar. Then he's got the problem with Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. Then he's got problems with the Philistines and Abimelech. That's in the next couple chapters. God calls us to uncertainty and difficulties. But we see God made a promise to Abraham. And we follow the promise. Now God says, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. So you will be a blessing, and so you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. God called him and made him a promise. You're going to go, and you're going to have uncertainty and difficulties. Genesis 12:7. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, "To your descendants, I will give this land." He made a promise. Chapter 13. The, uh, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot separated from him, "Lift up your eyes. Look to the place where you are. North." Um, south, east, west, all this land, I'm going to give to you and your descendants. Chapter 15, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not fear, Abram, I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. And behold, seven, chapter 17, 4, my covenant is with you, and you will be a father to a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but I will call you Abraham. I made you a father, a multitude of nations, a father of multitude. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between you and me, your descendants and their descendants throughout generations with an everlasting covenant. I will give to you and your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. God calls us, but we don't always know where he's going to send us uncertainty and difficulty. You're going through it. God still has called you how to live, how to trust him. We need to trust him. I know at the age of, I wrote it down here to make sure. Yeah, the age of 24, when I told you I was in Chicago, young man, God called me to leave Philadelphia. I said, I like Philadelphia. In fact, 
before I applied to Moody, there was a college in Philadelphia, a Bible college. I said, good, I'm going to go here. Something happened, and he said, now, I don't want to go to Chicago. But I felt God called me. He calls us, and we have to respond. He promises, really, two things. If he's, he's called you, and second, I will go with you. It doesn't matter, the uncertainties. Don't always have to know the, the certainties. God has called you. He called me two years later from Chicago to go to New York. Of all places, Brooklyn. But God did say, I'll go with you. And I've called you. I didn't know too much about Brooklyn in those days. Five years later, after I got comfortable again in Brooklyn, God says, we're going to leave Brooklyn. I don't want to leave Brooklyn. I like it here in Brooklyn. I'm going to take you to Dallas. Dallas, what's that? No, no, I, I, I knew what Dallas was. But it was beyond Chicago. At the age of 31, I want to make a life. I want to make a family. I want to settle down. God called me. God says, I'll go with you. But what's down there? I don't want to go to Dallas. We know we can trust God. Take us from the known to the unknown. Follow the story along the next month. After God takes us from that, God will take you from children. No, no. God will take you from comfort to uncomfortable. What did I write here? God will take you from comfort to discomfort. He does that. See, God takes us from known to unknown, from comfort to discomfort. Why? To, bu to build our faith, to show you that he's called you, to show that he's with you. We got the story. We know the great story of Joseph. Comfort, safety, and love. Follow Joseph. Genesis chapter 37. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. Uh, Joseph was 17 years of age, wa uh, was pastoring the flock of his brothers while he was still a youth. He was a teen, just a teenager. Uh, in his father's home, he had brothers. He was uh, probably the baby until finally Benjamin was born. But Joseph was te a teenager. But the good thing was his father loved him more than all the other children. Now, we're not going to get into parent relationships, but... He was comfortable in his father's love. Not only that, father gave him a special tunic. Might be this, the tunic saying, you're before all your brothers. He was loved. He had special dreams. He was the favorite one. Joseph probably felt very comfortable in the home, even if his brothers didn't like him because, because there was respect for the father. And he was, uh, he was the favorite. He had special dreams. And it says, while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah, the sons and the sons of Zilpah, his father's other wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report uh, about them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph. There it is. He was comfortable. He was loved more than all the other sons. He was Jacob's favorite. I know everyone, family, today's psychology is, oh, that's bad for the family. Father shows favoritism. We're not getting into that. All I'm getting into, how comfortable Joseph was in his house. And he was made, uh, the, got the double portion of the firstborn. And it says, because he was the son of his old age, he gave him a special, very colored tunic. J Joseph was favored. He was comfortable. Now, I wrote down here, and I thought about it in my life. One time when I was very comfortable, I lived in New Jersey in a place called Livingston, New Jersey. I felt very nice and safe and comfortable. Fran and I used to talk about Livingston, New Jersey. Actually, it was a very Jewish area. They used to call it Livingstein. It was a good, good Jewish area. We felt very comfortable there. In fact, Fran used to say, where do you think we'd like to retire? And I said, here in Livingston. Livingston's wonderful. We had it good there in Livingston. We liked it very, very much. We uh, had a nice little home, our first home, and we, we appreciated that home. And, and we had a nice congregation. Our children were in a good believing school. We had a congregation and family and friends all around us. You know, I remember sometimes standing in my driveway in my nice little ranch house that we had, and I looked down the street, beautiful, typical American street, American family, American neighborhood, and it was such a great neighborhood. It actually, the schools are in, some of the, uh, the high schools are in America's best high schools, and they say in the list of that, and I used to sit there, not like Nebuchadnezzar did, but I used to look down at the, the street like this. This is nice. I liked it. 
I like my house right behind me. Not a big house, a small house, 13, 14 hundred square feet. I saw our little yard, the grass, the street, the schools in Livingston. It was nice, and I felt very, very comfortable. I imagine Joseph felt comfortable in his home. The problem is God calls us from comfort to discomfort. Everything for me was good, nice, safe, but sometimes God calls us away from that through persecution and difficulties. Follow along, Joseph, comfortable, persecute, but then persecution and discomfort entered his life. That's what God does. He allows it in your life. Discomfort. Why? That's not a kind and loving God, is it? Yes, because he wants to build your faith. He wants to make people who depend on him. He wants to make people who worship and love him, not things and comfort and known and security. God wants you and I to seek him. If you're comfortable with the things that you have, beware. God can take them away from you. Not because he's mean and vindictive and wicked, because he wants you to appreciate his mercy and love and kindness and goodness. God does it for good. Joseph, comfortable. So it came about, Genesis 37, came about when Joseph reached his brothers to check on them. They stripped Joseph of his tunic, very colored tunic that was on him, and they took him and threw him into a pit. Um, a pit in the wilderness in Israel, a pit that was, and it's, the writer says here, the pit was empty with no water. One of my teachers said, a pit in the wilderness, in the desert, with no water, what might you find? Some crawling creatures that if they bite you, it does not feel too good. He's in a pit. Remember, he's just 17 years old. He was comfortable in his father's house. And it goes on. And then some Midianite tra uh, tra traders passed by, so they pulled him up, lifted Joseph up out of the pit, and then his brothers sold him to these Midianites, these Ishmaelites, um, for 20 shekels of silver. And thus they brought Joseph into Egypt. He was comfortable and safe. And all of a sudden, the young man was sold out by his brothers who were talking of killing him. Instead, they just sold him, and he goes down to Egypt as a young man. That's discomfort. That's what God does many times in our life. He takes you from comfort to discomfort. Look to him. That's what he wants. And it says, they, uh, for 20 seconds of silver, then they, they uh, brought Joseph into Egypt. Meanwhile, he's there in Egypt. The Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officers, the captain of the bodyguard. So Joseph was there in the house. And he was being blessed in the house, even though he was a lonely teenager, alone. And it says, so Joseph Master uh, took him and put him in a jail. Can, can that things get worse, folks? Here's a godly spiritual, maybe a brash young teenager, maybe boasting of his dreams. Yeah, but he's still a young kid. And they got, now they put, he's not only in Egypt, he's got to go to a jail cell in Egypt. Can't imagine that. I was a young man in the Air Force Reserves, so I didn't have to go to Vietnam. And I remember signing up for the Air Force Reserves. I was a safe, maybe spoiled, comfortable young man in my teens in Philadelphia. And I felt nice there. And then all of a sudden, I joined the Air Force Reserves, and they took me to a far-off land called Texas. It might as well have been Vietnam. It wasn't. But I remember walking around in Texas, thinking I was so alone, away from my house all alone in this place. Not only that, was I in Texas. I had these mean people barking orders at me, screaming, watch, do this, do this, get in the kitchen, do this. I felt like I was in prison. I really, I wasn't, I'm not, but, but I felt alone. I can't imagine here, in a jail cell. And then it says, he was confined, uh, the king's, where the king's prisoners were, confined there, he was in jail. Genesis 41.1. Now it happened at the end of two years that Pharaoh had a dream and he was standing by the Nile he was there for two years as this young man he may have thought back what it was like in his father's house when it was comfortable Genesis 42 then they said to one another 
uh, the brothers after this later on. They were talking about it. Yeah, we are guilty concerning our brother because we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us. So it's telling us that when he was in the pit, he was pleading with his brothers not to do this, to save him. The distress when he pleaded with us, and yet we would not listen. Therefore, distress has come upon us. They, he, they took him from his comfort zone to things. God does that. Now, remember, I, w- I was telling you, I was very comfortable. I was comfortable in Dallas, but I was very, very comfortable in Livingston, New Jersey. Remember where Fran and I were going to retire? I was very, very comfortable there. Then it all turned. It all turned just like that. I, I felt like I was king of my world. I had a wonderful world. Then all of a sudden, November 29th, 1995. Must mean something if I still remember it. You know. But it all turned that day because God didn't want me in Jersey anymore. I knew what I had in Jersey. I felt safe and good in Jersey. And God says, no, no, I got something else for you. You don't want to know what God has for you or how he's going to get you there. It all turned on that day. My leaders and chosen people, I worked with chosen people. I was safe and secure with chosen people. My leaders and chosen people, we bumped heads. You know, people bump heads. But you don't want to bump heads with your, your boss. And so it all turned. My leaders and chosen people. They talked to my leaders in my congregation. And all of a sudden, I had to leave there. I had to leave my home, my friends, my possessions. I had to move. I did not feel good. The amazing thing was God was doing it. He was pushing me. God does it through various means and circumstances. And so God was pushing me out. You know, I do remember, though, when I was leaving, one of the last times I was there in the congregation, one young man, I remember to this day, because no one was with me, no one encouraged me, had no friends at that point there. They all sort of, I was a pariah to everybody. One man took me aside, and he said, listen, I know God is with you. I know God is moving you out. And I know God is going to do something great with you. Nice to think back now. But when he said it to me, I said, yeah, nice, very nice. He encouraged me a little bit, but still, I wanted to see it now. But God wasn't going to give it to me now. Through different circumstances, God will move you out. And that's what he did with Joseph. From persecution and distress, fill it in, he rose him to the heights. That's what God does for us. He gives us something better. Follow along. Joseph. He, uh, Pharaoh had a dream, and Joseph appeared before the Pharaoh. Now the proposal, it seemed good to Pharaoh that they brought Joseph out of prison. He d- told the Pharaoh his dream. Then Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this Joseph who was in prison? We find a man like this in whom is the spirit, a divine spirit. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has informed you of all this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you, Joseph. You shall be over my house. Just came out of the dungeon. Just came out of jail. Standing before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, okay, from there, you're going to be over my whole house. Suddenly, whenever God wants in his way and time, God will lift you up. Therefore, humble yourself under the hand of God so that he might exalt you in his way and time. That's what he did to Joseph. And Pharaoh said, "Um, you shall be over my house, and according to your command, all my people shall do homage to you. Only in the throne I'm going to be greater than you. Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all of Egypt. Can you imagine? Safe in his home, secure. Put him in a pit. Put him in a jail. He might have thought God forgot about him. God doesn't forget us. God wants to use us, but he wants us to be found faithful and trust in him. Then Pharaoh took his ring from his hand, put it on Joseph's hand, clothed him in garments, fine linen, and gold necklace all around him. He made him ride in his chariot, and they proclaimed before him, bow the knee before Joseph. I imagine Joseph 
Well, now he's almost 30 years old at this point, through 12 years, 13 years of difficulties. Ma- imagine there on the throne uh, with the chariot with Pharaoh, and I must have said, wow, look what God's done. It's amazing. I still long for my house, which he did. But God was raising him up for his God's purpose. He made him ride in his second chariot, proclaimed before him, bow the knee, and he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, though I'm Pharaoh, yet without your permission, no one shall raise his hand or foot in all of Egypt without you. Then Pharaoh uh, named uh, Joseph, gave him a new name, gave him a wife. He had two children. God tremendously raised him up. Genesis 45, God sent me, he says to his brothers, God sent me here to preserve for you a remnant in the earth. God had a purpose. And to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all his household and ruler over all the house of Egypt. Joseph says to his brothers later on, as for you, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. God meant it for good. I think back to that one guy who said to me, God has something great for you. You know, when I look back to that, I was in Jersey 1995 or so, the end of 1995, and I think back about that, and you know, I tell people, which I really will say to to this day, I mean, I was... Let me see, 1995, so I forget how old I was there. 47, 48 years old. I feel my life just began at that point. God has so blessed from that moment on when I was having that transition and and I left New Jersey. I didn't know what to make of it. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know what I was doing. God took Fran and me and my two daughters. The good thing that God blessed us with was I had Fran and my two daughters. And we always said the Feldman Four together. And, but God was moving us out. And he did that over a period of time. And then God brought me, remember my transition? I, I just thought of that while I'm talking to you. He took me from Philly to Chicago. He took me back to Philly. And then he took me from Philly to Dallas. And then he went back to Philly. And then he took me from Dallas to New York and from New York all the way across. God was moving me out. I like that. Maybe just like Abraham from Ur of the Chaldeans, and he moved them all the way west to Israel. And God moved me all the way west to California. And God has blessed us tremendously with Shuvi Israel, with family, my daughters, six grandkids, great congregation, friends, God, his word. God raised us to the heights. Even though you were, you, you were known and comfortable, it takes you to the unknown. Even though you were safe and cozy, takes you to discomfort, takes you to discomfort. Follow along. Third story. God takes us from prosperity. I don't like this one. From prosperity to poverty. God does that. When you're safe and secure, he takes you from finances, maybe, and takes it away from you. We see the royal family here. Follow along. The story of Moses. Um, Chapter 2 of Exodus. Now, when she could hide him no longer... Moses' mother. She got a wicker basket, covered it with, uh, covered over with tar and pitch. She put a child in it, Moses, the child, and set it among the reeds at the bank of the Nile. When Pharaoh's daughter opened it, she saw the child. Behold, the boy was crying, and she had pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew children. I said he took him from poverty, from uh, riches. What riches? This little child was put in a wicker basket. Who discovered him? Pharaoh's daughter. She had fame. She had wealth. She had family. She was royalty. Moses was made her child. Exodus 2. The child grew. And she brought him, uh, his mother, she weaned him, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son, and she named him Moses, and said, because I drew him out of the Nile. Moses was in the house of Pharaoh. Some people might not know, but he was there for 40 years. 40 years. He grew up under the royal family. He grew up with everything that you can imagine. Royalty, wealth. He was educated. He had power, position, popular, a warrior, a hero in Egypt. Riches beyond belief. 
It was at this time that Moses was born. He was lovely in the sight of God. He was nurtured for three months in his father's home. And after he had been set outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him away, nurtured him as his own son. That's what we already just said. Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians. He was a man of power in words and in deeds. You saw the movie, The Ten Commandments. You know, Moses, Moses. The people from Ethiopia looked at him and said, he is wise. Moses had everything. Royal family. Power and deeds. But when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered his mind to visit his brethren. He was there for 40 years, the sons of Israel. Moses was wonderful and comfortable. He had everything. I felt that way many times in my life. Yeah, I said in Jersey. But you know, when you go off sometimes to school, Moody, or for me, Dallas Seminary, when you're there, sometimes the, the students don't have it so good. Now, I was 31 when I went to Dallas with Fram. The next year we had Rachel. But when we went there, people, you know, they struggled. We didn't struggle. No, we in Dallas, we didn't struggle. God made it very good for us. She had a great job. She was, uh, it was not a real estate. Yeah, she showed people around the place we live. Great, great uh, complex. It was wonderful and beautiful, modern. The complex was about two square, two and a half square miles all around. It had, the complex had, I think, about 22 swimming pools. They had a pool in the middle of the whole complex. We had money from her job. We had money coming in for me to go through school. I was on a scholarship. I had all my school paid for. We had it very, very well in Dallas. In fact, we had it so well in Dallas, at the end of four years, Fran says, maybe we should stay here in Dallas. Maybe we should live in Dallas. It was that. She, oh, she wanted it. She really loved Dallas. There was Jewish people there. There was ministry there. Not only that, the head of the chosen people ministry in Dallas area said, I'm going to retire, and you can take over my position. Man, I had everything. I had the family, I had the royalty, I had it all. He says, you'll take over my position. You'll be the, the Southwest Area Director for all the chosen people. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. I like that. But God didn't want that. No, no. He wanted to take all that away from me. I was trusting on that. But I felt comfortable. I was royalty. I had royalty. What I, I put down here is we were comfortable, but it's a bad Take it from known to unknown, from comfort to discomfort, from riches to poverty. And so God took me out of Dallas. In fact, shortly thereafter, the head there of the Southwest said, you know, we've decided, I'm staying. You can go back to New York. And I had to go back to New York at that point. And I had to go on this training program for chosen people. I had to leave Fran and my daughter Rachel for eight weeks. I had to prove that I was loyal to the organization. I mean, I was just king of the hill. Now I had nothing. Not only that, the money that they were giving me to stay there in Dallas, they said, we're going to take that away from you. You have to prove yourself. And then maybe we'll rehire you. From king to poverty to, to nothing. But that's what God does. That's what God did with Moses. Moses had everything. Problem was, he visited the children of Israel. A shepherd in the desert. How long did I say Moses was king of the hill? Forty years. So then, everything turns. Follow along. He becomes a shepherd in the desert. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses. Moses was next in line. You saw what Cecil B. DeMille did. He made Moses next in line for the Pharaoh. And it said, but Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh, settled in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill, uh, to fill the trouts with water for their father's flock. Now Moses was willing to stay there. What, a couple days with the, this guy? Stay with the man. And he, but he gave his daughter support to Moses. Then she gave birth to a son, and he named him Gershom, for he said, I've been a sojourner, sojourner in a foreign land. How long was he there? From Egypt, from the king, the royalty, down to a shepherd in the desert. He was there in Egypt 40 years. At this remark, Moses fled and became an alien in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Listen carefully. After 40 years had passed, 
alone in the desert for 40 years. He was a shepherd. Because God takes us from riches to poverty. Don't read it wrong. God loves to do that. He does. Not for meanness. With a heart of love and compassion. God takes you from the known to the unknown. From comfort to discomfort. From riches to poverty. Because God wants you to look up. Look up for him. He will lead you, even in the unknown, even through discomfort, even through poverty, because you have everything when you have God. And God purposely took it all away to make us trust. He wants you and I to go through our life every day trusting, with him, trusting him. I tell Fran, I tell all of you all the time, every morning, this morning I did it as well, in my prayer time with God, I go through the whole day with God. I really do. I went through my devotions with the Lord today. I said, Lord, I'm coming here to the congregation today. I said, can you guard me? I don't want to hurt people. I don't want to hurt you. I'm going to commit my time at Shuva to you today. I thought of what I might do afterwards. I committed that to him. I said, God, you can bless it or you can take it away. You can do anything you want. God wants you every single day to commit that day to him. Whatever you're going to do. Make your plans. But then so, Lord, not my will, yours. You do what you want. It's that crucial. You are not your own. Don't wake up and say, my day is my own. It's not. God wants you to turn and look to him. I have no idea where I was. Oh, yeah. He was 40 years in the wilderness. I told you the transition that God took me from Dallas and comfortable to uh, uncomfortable. I didn't know what God was going to do with me after Dallas. He took Moses and made him a leader of the nation. Therefore, come now, I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. This Moses, whom they disown, who, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one whom God sent to be both ruler and deliverer with the help of the angel who appeared to him in the thorn bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt, in the Red Sea, in the wilderness, for 40 years. This is Moses, whom uh, said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness, together with the angel who was speaking to him in the bush on Mount Sinai. That angel who spoke to him out of the bush was Yeshua himself before he came to earth. And he was with our fathers. He received the living oracles to pass them on to you. God rose up Moses and made him great. From riches to poverty. Then God in his time lifts you up. That's what he wants to do. The end of Moses' life, it says, someone wrote about Moses. Since that time, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. For all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent uh, him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh, all his servants and all his land, for all the mighty power and all the great, uh, uh, great terror which Moses performed in the sight of Israel, God rose him up in God's time. That's what God loves to do. He takes you from wealth to poverty. And so when I left Texas, comfortable Texas, God took me. And Fran and I remember this. We didn't know where we were going. We were going back to New York. It was a different time. He took us back to New York. And try to imagine all that we had in Dallas. We get to New York, Long Island. We're in a boarding house. Fran, me, and Rachel were in one room. We were trying to keep Rachel quiet. We didn't want to disrupt the boarding house. So what Fran did was take Rachel out in her stroller all day long so she wouldn't bother any people in the house. Me, I was looking for a place to stay. And uh, I didn't know what my salary would be or anything. God takes us to poverty and back. After that, God settled us in New Jersey in a place, as I told you before, called Livingston, New Jersey. God made it great. That's what he does. The last thing. See if I can uh, sum this up. God takes us from fields to caves. The story of David. David was a peaceful shepherd. We see in the book of 1 Samuel that uh, 
Thus Jesse made seven his sons pass before Samuel. Samuel came to Jesse's house to have a big meal to anoint the next king of Israel. Seven sons passed before Jesse, uh, before Samuel. Not one of them. And uh, Samuel says to Jesse, is this it? I know God sent me here. And Jesse says, well, yeah. But there's this dreamer out there, my youngest son. What about him? Uh, you, you don't want him in here. Why not? Well, he likes the fields. He likes being out there. He's taking care of the sheep. He loves the sheep. Really? What else is he doing out there? Oh, he's playing music. That's what he does. He's a dreamer. He's playing music? Yes, he's writing songs. He's writing psalms. He's feeding the sheep. He's so happy and comfortable and peaceful. You don't want him. And he's just a boy. And of course he says, bring him in. And I like what it says, 1 Samuel 16, verse 12. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was red. I like that word better. He was ruddy. He says a red, with beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, uh, for this is he. And Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel arose and went to Rome. David was happy, peaceful, content, music, poems, psalms. David basically just said, I'm happy. And so what did God do? I said, here, he takes him from the fields to the caves. What he did for David, he, picture David in the house. Samuel the prophet anoints him, and Samuel says, you're the next king of Israel. Oh, yeah, that's nice, that's cool. He's the next king. All his brothers, why him? Who's he? Youngest brother. I'm the next king of Israel. So what did God do for him, the next king of Israel? The one who was happy and peaceful and writing his psalms, and speaking to God, and playing his music. God made him a hunted criminal. That's, boy, this doesn't sound like a good God you want to follow, does it? But he lifts you up. Made promises to Abraham. Made promises to Joseph. And made him head of the land. Made Moses the head of a great nation. David became a hunted criminal. And I don't have to give you all the verses, but in 1 Samuel chapter 18 and the rest of the thing, Saul, the king of Israel, got jealous of David while he was in the king's presence. He took a spear to kill David and threw the spear at David twice, and David escaped. David was running from Saul. Then it says, 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 1. So David departed from there and escaped to the cave. He hid in the fields in the caves. He was running. He was a hunted criminal. I imagine David must have said sometimes, God, I remember Samuel anointed me that day. I'm the next king. What are you doing? Then he says, I know one day Saul's going to kill me. He was a hunted criminal. He had to run in the forest for Samuel 23. We're not going there. He ran in the forest in the fields. And then it says now in 1 Samuel 24, now when Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David, behold, is in the wilderness of En Gedi. We go to that wilderness on our trip. That's pretty cool. Then David, uh, then Saul took 3,000 men. Da uh, Saul and Israel was hunting out this young, young man who was the anointed king of Israel. And David finally said, 1 Samuel 27, 1, then David said to himself, now I will perish one day at the hands of Saul. David maybe gave up hope at that one point. I know in the transitions of my life, I wondered what God was doing with me. I heard the words of this guy saying, God's going to do something great with you. I, and, I, and there I was, I remember, feeling alone with nothing. And this one guy said, God is going to raise you up to do something. And I said to myself, yeah, it's nice for you to say that. But yeah, until then, what now? I was an outcast. No congregation. Nothing. Now what? Almost two years before, through all things, God brought me here to God, raised me up to a great congregation. David was a hunted animal. He became the king with the kingdom. Second Samuel 2. And it came about afterwards that David inquired of the Lord, shall I go up, after Saul died, to the cities of Judah? And the Lord said, go up. David went up. He said, where? Go up to Hebron. 
So David went up there with his wives, and David brought his men with him, each with his household, and they lived in the cities of Hebron. Then the men of Judah came there and anointed David king over the house of Judah, and they, and they told David, saying, they, and they told David a certain message. The southern kingdom, Judah made David king for seven years. Then during that time, the people of the northern kingdom, Israel came, and they made David king over Israel. And David, the hunted criminal, became king over the southern kingdom, then the king of the north, he became king over all Israel, united the whole kingdom. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, David became, and it says, 2 Samuel 5, uh, 5, 5, at Hebron he reigned over Judah for seven years, six months, and in Jerusalem he reigned 33 years over all Israel. David captured Jerusalem and he made it the kingdom. David was a hunted criminal, and shortly thereafter, he became the king of all Israel. Now I remember, and I'll just finish up with this in my story, but with this, I was in Jersey, and I was leaving Jersey, and I got a message from some people in California, from Dana and a couple others. And they said to me, will you come to California? God I was a hunted criminal. God hunted me out. Because in God's way, in God's time, he lifts you up. He lifted David on the verge of death from Saul and the people of Israel and the spears and, and the Philistines because he was safe and screwed. We are in God's bubble. Nothing can touch you. Even though you're hiding in caves, even though you're in discomfort, even though you're in poverty, even though you're going unknown, God will find you. And they found me in Jersey. And Dana said, would you come and start our congregation in California? And I came to California to be with them. In 1997, we started Shuri Israel. God in his way and time knows what he's doing, even though we don't. But what does he want from us? He wants us to remain faithful. And God will do what he wants. He will give you a kingdom. As he did David, it says, Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. You don't have to have Judah and Israel and the kingdom of Israel. You don't have to have that. God gives you his little kingdom for you. Everyone has their own kingdom. God will take you from the peace of the field through the caves and lift you up in his way in time. That's what he does. He takes us from the known to the unknown. He takes you from comfort to discomfort. He takes you from riches to poverty. He will take you from the fields to the caves. Why? So you will look to him, and he will lift you up in his time. I love that verse. First Peter, we don't have it there. But it says that God will raise, humble yourself under the hand of God so that he will raise you up in his way in time. We follow our example of our Messiah, Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, all the, the heroes of faith, Hebrews 11, surrounding us, let us lay aside, aside every encumbrance, everything that's going to stop you. And the sin which so easily entangles us, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Run with endurance, even though you don't know where you're going, even though it's discomforting, even though you have no money, even though you're hiding like a criminal. Fixing our eyes on Yeshua, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the suffering, endured the cross, despising the shame, he sat down at the right hand of God, of the throne of God. In God's way, in God's time, he will lift you up if you remain faithful. Through difficult and unforeseen circumstances, we should trust God to bring about success and a glorious future. We need to put our trust in Him. Father God, thank You for Your Word. Thank You, Lord, that we don't like what You always do, but we can trust You because You have a good, good, loving, merciful plan for all of us. May we be found faithful when we don't know where we're going, when we're in total discomfort, when we have nothing, when we're running and hiding because you will lift us up in your way and your time. Turn our hearts to you, Lord. 
May we follow you and make you the center of our lives. For we ask all these things in Yeshua's name. Amen.